Uh, we give the Lord uh, glory and praise and honor for gathering us into his presence one more time. We are here to dive into the word of Jesus. As he told his disciples in John 6, 63, that the words that he speak, they are spirit and they are life. So as we are marching on this journey towards the fulfillment of the plan of God in the earth and for the ages, we have to be walking by his word and we have to be following his principles. So we give ourselves with diligence to the study and the inquiry of the word of God such that we are better informed, as Paul told uh, to Timothy, that he should study to show himself approved unto God, a workman who needs not to be ashamed, but one who rightly divides the word of truth, because it is the word that bringeth and giveth life to us. Now, as we study the word, we don't just study the word to appreciate the word from uh, a mental point of view. We study the word that we might become the word, uh, that the word might find room in us, and that the word, uh, through our embrace of it, will bring us to experience what the words are intended to experience. So, whenever we touch the Bible, or whenever we seek to study God's word, it's never just to know. It, uh, it is to know via experience. It's to come to that place where we have the experience of Jesus. So, we started last week on this topic of the word and the works of Jesus, and by the grace of God, we are going to uh, move on and go further into this study, amen, which promises to be very, very interesting, very dynamic, and I hope uh, we will garner a lot of insights from it. So what should be my mindset when I'm doing this study? What should be my thought process is how does this apply to me, right? How does this apply to me and how do I apply this, right? So how does it relate to me and how do I take it and relate to my? be my mindset when I'm doing this study, what should be in my thought process is how does this apply to me, right? How does this apply to me and how do I apply this, right? So how does it relate to me and how do I take it and relate to my word, my world, my life, okay? So we, we looked uh, in a quick way last week on the Lord's Prayer as a model for the intention of God, right? So when Jesus taught them in Matthew 6 uh, how to pray, it was God's design to show them uh, how they should approach heaven, but it also gives us an insight as to the structure and the construct of how government uh, works between the earth and heaven and man. So man, God, earth, heaven. So the Lord's Prayer is kind of a template. It gives us insight as to how we regulate our world, uh, and we do this through communicating with God. This is very, very important for us to get. So we went on and we looked at the kingdom point of view, uh, which exposes the notion that uh, we are subjects within a kingdom that is run by a king, and that king is God. And he has a vision, he has his, a desire, and he has designed the world in a certain way. And so we are sons within the kingdom of God, and where, we, where he starts us out is not where we are going to end up because he progresses, right? We have progressive revelation, we have progressive understanding, and then we come to progressive uh, materialization of whatever God intends. So when God started Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we were in his mind, right? 2023, May 31st, it was also a part of God's plan. So what we are looking at now wasn't where it started in Eden, but where we are now was a part of the plan of God that was instituted at Eden. So as we walk with God, we come to find a few things here. So the earth really is a kingdom. We went through that last week. And we're going to go into a little bit of it more uh, this week. The earth is really a kingdom. It's a kingdom that God gave to man, right? So the earth is a kingdom that is to be run by man, and man needs to be under the directorate of God, right? Under the instructions of God. So God created the heavens, created earth, God put a, a, um, a garden in the earth, planted a garden, Eden, 
and put Adam in the garden and gave Adam charge over everything. There's a reason why we keep saying this. It's important. We have to understand that we are designed to rule. We are not designed for things to happen to us by chance. We are designed to direct things, right? And we have, for a large part, subscribed to this pacifist view of things. We are, you know, we are just here. Uh, we are going through the motions. We, we are alive. You have a profession, secularly. Uh, you, you make some money, amen. You have a dream to buy a house, uh, get a car, uh, get married, whatever, have children, uh, develop some rocket, amen, to go to Pluto, I don't know. Uh, we, we have these desires as human beings, and we kind of live out our lives in a very individualistic way. And oftentimes, even as Christians, we miss the bigger picture, that we are a part of a plan for all time and all ages, that we are a part of a plan that God has instituted. We are a big part of the plan of God. So we realize that earth is designated, uh, designed by the king as the dominion of man, right? Or the domain of man. It is provisioned with all the necessary elements for man's success. So earth has everything we need to succeed, right? Wherever God puts you, he puts everything there for you to succeed. Now everything isn't cut and dry, right? But in the Garden of Eden, technically it was cut and dried, and all that Adam needed to do was to tend to the garden. Are you with me? All he needed to do was to dress it. All he needed to do was make sure the fruits were eaten, hallelujah, and everything was in its place. So he didn't have much work to do, so to speak, as it relates to what work we have to do today. So it God provisions. He makes preparations before he puts you in a place. So man was created from earth. God breathed into us, give us life, and here we are running things. So we are God's crowning jewel. We looked at that last week. I'm moving very fast here, and I will slow down when we reach where I believe we picked up from last week, okay? So uh, God made man, and man is God's crowning work. So we are designed to rule the earth under God's direct guidance, right? So in the church now, in the church age now, we have relationship and fellowship with God. It is not something that is overnight. It's something that started all the way from the Garden of Eden where man was designed to have fellowship with God. And we, we, we kind of paid attention to the commandment of God to Adam in the garden when he told him, right, after he got Eve, after Eve was taken out of his side, basically, as a ribbon was composed, amen, by the creative uh, acts of God, the, both of them were charged, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue the earth, and have dominion over the earth. Now, this is where the work of man really would reside. The work of man wouldn't be in tilling the soil and tilling the ground and making sure the bananas and the apples and the grapes and everything comes forth nicely. That wasn't his real main job. That was something he should do, amen, with little effort. What his effort, I believe, would be concentrated on is being fruitful, is multiplying, is replenishing the earth, is subduing the earth, is having dominion in the earth. And God intended that that would be done a certain way, right? So he would be God in charge in heaven, and he would communicate with Adam and Eve in the earth and give them instructions. In fact, the Bible says that God would come down here at the cool of the day, and he would sup and he would have fellowship with Adam, amen. And by default, it would be Eve because there were two now, one flesh. Whatever was good for Adam is good for Eve. And whatever Adam learned, Eve would have been exposed to, okay? So then we, we moved on and we saw that there are consequences for actions. Where Adam failed, Adam chose to disobey God's single uh, negative uh, requirement where God says, of every tree you should eat, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We came to understand that man died. Man died immediately. How? Man lost fellowship with God, right? So we realize now that God had established the world to operate in a certain way, right? The, the earth should bring forth of its fullness, give to man. Man would not have to be worrying about food and clothes and all of that. He would now be focused on the greater task at hand, which is to bring the earth into alignment with whatever the plan of God was in heaven. We made the point last week that man had dominion in the earth, right, over everything that is upon the earth and everything that flies in the air above the earth and everything that was on the earth and below the earth. So that means that any entity or element that was in the earth was on the man's command. And I believe, therefore, that demons and all of these uh, fallen angels that were in invading the space of earth were the entities that Adam should have brought under subjection in the earth. 
right? For the animals were created in, in, in natural order. Amen. There was no dysfunctionality as we could observe in the Bible. Are you with me? Did you read of any? And there's none suggested in the writings of Moses. Everything was in its place and Adam was now to take dominion, have a power, subdue. So that word subdue means to bring something that is out of control into control. So the animal kingdom was not out of control, then it must be the spiritual world that Adam should have brought under subjection in the earth as God's representative in the earth. Hello, somebody. What a profound thing. There is nothing new under the sun. We were born, born, designed to rule, to have dominion over creeping things, flying fowls, and over everything upon the face of the earth, and that was in the ear. Praise God. So we realize that man made a mistake, man uh, chose the wrong thing, and there are consequences. And we are learning here, and we have to point this out, that God allows you to live out your choice. Because you cannot be said to have a choice that you can't live out. And the world will be wondering, why is it that God is allowing so many evil and so much this and that and that to go on? Murder, blah, blah, blah. And where is the good God? Why doesn't he intervene? God is allowing man to live out his choice, right? But at the end of your choice is going to become, you're going to get a reward or you're going to get a punishment. Hello, somebody. Amen. Do what you want to do. Amen. Obey what you want to obey. But at the end of it, you are going to have either a reward or a consequence, a negative consequence or a positive result of it. So we, we understand here that the king had a vision, and the vision meant that man would have to choose to work with what God has said. So God made man. Man is God's created work, right? Okay? So then what we find now is that God designed to have a kingdom of sons, right? Think, uh, those who were born out of him. Now, in a less direct way, man was born out of God. Anything you create comes from you as the creator. So Adam was like God's son in the earth. Eh? So God's idea is that there's a kingdom of sons who choose to follow their father, the king. Okay? So God is still allowing everybody to choose to follow him or to choose to stay home. Huh? It's either you choose to follow him or you choose to stay home wherever you feel comfortable. So what God realized, uh, uh, God, what, what God wants to realize in the earth is that his sons choose him and walk with him and through that fellowship have dominion in the earth. Right? So, sons of God, in our New Testament experience now, we are not just sons because we have been created. We are sons because we have been born again. And we are all directly related to the king. So long as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. And when you believe on him, you're going to repent of your sins. And you're, and you're going to be baptized, amen. And you're going to seek to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he will come to you, amen. Because none that come to him, he, he will shall in any wise reject and turn away. So a broken and a contrite heart. God is not going to despise. So what we realize is that the will of God is that the, the, his sons walk with his divine nature. And I want to pause to, to point out here that God never intended for us just to be like robots. He never had an uh, a, a, a Android mindset about us, if you will. God wanted us to be able to exercise our own will, right? He, was, he wanted us to exercise our own desires and our own likes and dislikes. But those desires and dislikes, right, and likes and dislikes, would be governed by the law of God, by what is right, by what is perfect. But when man fell... Man lost that ability to know what is right and what is wrong and to live in it, amen, without having to fight their flesh. So the fall brought man into the state where his desires were ruling him. And we're going to see this. This is so true in the earth. So whilst man has the capacity for divine nature, the flesh unregenerate nature is still having authority over man. Hallelujah. And that is one of the reasons why you need to have the Holy Spirit living in you, right? Because the only way for you to successfully resist the elements that are not after God is to submit to God. And then when you resist, you will have success. So if you don't have God in your life, right, if you're not following the will of God, you're going to find that you're unable 
to resist successfully the works of the dark world. So in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 2 through 4, uh, the Apostle Peter gives insight that God has given us everything for life and godliness, right? And homework was for you to have uh, memorized that scripture. Amen. Let me see those in the audience who have tried to memorize it. Amen. All right. Very good. Very good. Amen. So at least some of it must be somewhere up there in your memory, right? So His divine power hath given us everything for life. Just pause there. Everything for life that you could possibly need, His divine power hath given it. Now remember now, the Word of God is spirit and life. The Word of God cannot come back to Him void. So His divine power hath given me. Everybody say me. You have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you have the Spirit of God in you. You have the divine power, right, in you for life. Okay? And for godliness. How did you get um, uh, power for godliness? Through God's divine activity. His divine power has given us everything for life. It has given us everything for godliness. And how has it given it us to, to us? Through the knowledge of him that have called us unto virtue, glory and virtue. So in order for the divine power to be manifested in our lives, we have to know Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, you're not going to experience the power. Because to, to, to know him is to experience all that is him, right? His divine power hath given us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who have called us unto glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises whereby amen we become partakers of the divine nature so his divine power give us the ability to become partakers of the divine nature now this is very serious saints it means that every single person that believes on the lord jesus that walks after the lord jesus you have the the nature of god in you so the nature of god is in you if you have the Holy Spirit, you're walking after God, you're living by the Word, there is a divine nature that is in you. Hello? And the divine nature has the divine powers with, it, with, it, with the nature. So when you have the Spirit, you have the divine nature, you have the very God inside of you. Now, this is important to understand, praise God, that God has given us the divine power. So God has empowered us, right, to rule in the earth. Adam messed it up, but Jesus Christ comes back and gives it to us. For he says what? All power is given unto me both in and in. And then he told the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And lo, I am with you always. Hello, somebody. How is Jesus with us, with us always? Jesus, when he said these words, he was a physical man. He was in the days of the flesh. Am I right? So, how is he with us today if he's not lying? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see a little further on in the program. So, here we go. Jesus is with us, not just around us, but he is in us. And it is the presence of the Holy Spirit in you and in me that gives us the ability to overcome, give us the ability to live, give us the ability to walk, right? Give us ability to bring heaven to earth thy kingdom come on earth thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven how are we going to bring about that by we walking in the will and the power and obedience to god's word so earth really is a territory of heaven earth is a territory of heaven and we are the ambassadors now this has to sink in our spirits we are here on a mission we want to recolonize, right? We want to recolonize where? The earth, right? We want to recolonize the earth. What? With what? Sons 
of God. We want our brothers and our sisters who have not yet come back to fellowship with God to get back into fellowship with God and operate as sons of God. Hello, somebody. We need to get back to what? Being able to operate as sons of God. This has a lot of things to it. Many, many aspects to it. As sons of God, we are not supposed to be beggars in the earth. As sons of God, we have eternal life. As sons of God, we wield the powers of heaven by relationship through the Holy Spirit to God. So you notice how Jesus behaved. Amen. Wherever he went, he was bringing about the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven, certain things are true. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no sickness. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no disease. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no lack. In the kingdom of heaven, there is no disorder. There is no war. There is no fighting. There is peace. There is joy. There is fellowship. Do you get what I'm saying? In the kingdom of God, everything that man was designed to experience in the positive way is already existing in that realm. So our duty is to bring heaven to earth and the way we're going to get heaven to earth is that we have authority in the earth and we are going to speak those things that are in heaven bring them to the earth let there be peace hello somebody when people are sick we as sons of God we need to step up to them lay our hands on them and pray for them in Jesus name and believe because that's the currency that is the key that unlocks the powers of heaven in the earth we have to get back to the place or we have to get to the place more accurately where we begin to embrace this more closely that I am vested with power. I am vested not just the preacher. Come on somebody. It's not just the evangelist. It's, it's not just a Sunday school teacher. It's not just the apostle. It's not just the prophet. Whosoever believeth on me, Jesus says in John 14, the works that I do, the same works shall he do, and greater works than these. Huh? But guess what? Our minds are so taken up with our worries, with uh, how we're going to live through next week, with uh, how we're going to pay our mortgage, with uh, how we're going to buy some new clothes, with uh, how we're going to pay off our car note. Uh, why? Because our minds have not fully been transformed to think like sons. We think uh, like we uh, should be sons, but uh, we are not so sure if we are sons uh, because we have not yet fully realized the divine nature that is in us. We have not fully realize the power that is in our words, the power that is upon our tongue. God says, ask and you shall receive. He says, seek and you shall find. He says, knock and it shall be opened upon to you. But guess what? Most of the time, we do not operate with faith when we ask. When we ask, we do not operate with expectation as we wait. As we wait, we do not cultivate our faith through verbalizing what we expect. We just figure, hey, I just open my mouth and there is no heart connection. You have to be careful. The Bible says that the children of Israel did not walk into promised land. The ones that started out in Egypt did not end up in Canaan. Why? Amen. The adult ones, because they did not believe. When the word was spoken, they did not believe. If you don't believe the word, you will not experience what the word has in store for you that is only released when you believe. You have to believe. Are you with me, saints? All right. So sons are born into the kingdom uh, through rebirth where they are transformed from death to life, right? The method is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. Now, you have to walk in the spirit and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So notice that you have power and authority reinstated once you have the Holy Spirit. You've got wisdom and understanding. You have counsel and might. You have the knowledge and the fear of God. In other words, once you reconnect with God in fellowship, you have access to all the divine prerogatives. You have access to all the knowledge of heaven. You have access to the wisdom of God. You have access to the fear of God. So once you have fellowship with God, for example, and you come upon a challenge in your own life you have access to the answer to that challenge do you know that brethren oh my god almighty amen you come upon a river you come upon a serious situation there is a disease in your body there is a something that is buffeting you along your journey huh? you have the answer 
in God. You don't need a high priest. You don't need me to connect with God. And I don't need you to connect with God. What you need is to believe and come to God. He that cometh to God must must believe that he is and that he's a reward of them that diligently receive him. I want to tell you that why we are not living in a more full heaven on earth experience is because we are not walking in the terms of the covenant. We are not. We do it when we have some serious situations. For example, maybe if you hear that you have cancer, your faith might get really red hot. Praise God. Maybe if you hear that uh, somebody you love is undying, your faith might get really red hot. But when it comes to a common headache, uh, when it comes to a little toe problem, uh, we tend not to be as vociferous in our faith during those situations. Am I speaking the truth? Why is it that you pop an excedrin every now and again when your head starts to hurt you? Anybody in here take pain, pain pills every now and again, amen, when the pain hits you? Amen. One, two, two brave souls, uh, amen. The rest of us don't really have pain, amen. Uh, those that don't have pain, God bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Keep on living free of pain, yeah? Uh, but when you think about it, and you have a headache, an excruciating headache, what comes to your mind first, it isn't that God is my healer, is it? Speak the truth. Most of the time, it isn't that God is my healer, and I'm going to talk to daddy now. Father, in the name of Jesus, in fact, man always loved the easy way out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Why believe when I have a pill? Uh, why believe when I have some water and I can just pop two? Praise God. Amen. And allow biology to go to work. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Jesus never meant for us to live like that. Okay? He never meant for us to live like that. So he, his desire is that we preach the gospel. But in order to preach the gospel, you have to experience it, right? You first have to experience the gospel before you can preach it. We need to teach and model, right, doctrines, which are principles of belief, right? Our belief systems, our doctrines. There's one God. We believe in baptism in Jesus' name. We believe in divine healing. We believe in eternal life. Uh, we believe in uh, uh, what the mercy of God, the grace of God. These things we need to believe. Uh, then now, we need to do the works of Jesus Christ. Does your friend at work know that you are a son of God? Uh, does the man down the road from you know that you are a son of God? If you go to the shoemaker, will he know that there is something different about you? We really need to really, really ask ourselves some serious questions. Are we doing the works of Jesus? Do you think the work of Jesus is only visiting the orphans, the fatherless and the motherless? I mean, where is it recorded that Jesus visited an orphan home? Read. I don't see it. Huh? Is, 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 did, did Jesus make it a habit of giving out food to the poor? He would work miracles and feed thousands. But he never made it his point of duty to go give out to the poor. But that's a part of what we do, right? And it's a part of our human compassion towards those. That is exhorted in, in Isaiah chapter 58 that we should feed those of the members of our family that are destitute and are naked and are hungry and all. But that ain't really the full works of Jesus, really. No, that's, that's, that's actually a humanitarian exercise. The works of Jesus embody all that Jesus did, okay? So heaven on earth now, right, means that we have to establish and practice a complete vision of the king, right? Man is in trouble. Your neighbor is in trouble. Your friend needs a salvation. This is not something we just speak about lightly. This is something that must convict you real. You must realize it's true. If you are not walking with God, when the day of judgment come, you are going to come up for judgment. And your works are not going to be good. Because without Jesus, you cannot please God. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot please God. Without the blood of Jesus, you cannot walk sin free. You cannot live sin free. I'm telling you, you need the blood. You need Jesus for deliverance. You need Jesus for healing. You need Jesus for a purpose-focused life. Right? For the kingdom of heaven to come to earth, we have to have a passionate pursuit 
of the principles of heaven. Not just for food and for clothing and for a little healing here. We need to pursue the principles of heaven to see deliverance, broad scale. To see magnanimous things happen in our world. To see thieves and men who are looters and murderers and rapists and all the bad, abjectful behavior in our society. It is through application of kingdom principles that we are going to see intervention. Huh? When your friend is sick, they need to meet your God who is the healer. When a man is going out of his right mind, he needs to meet your God who is the great counselor. I don't hear the folks. When all hell hits your home, the, your home needs to experience the peace of God. When there is tumult on your workplace, hallelujah, you need to be able to step in there and bring resolution, a, a true a spiritual wisdom, natural wisdom through the gifts of the Spirit that should be upon your life. Hello, somebody. You ought to become conscious and aware that I am a son of God and that I am a carrier of the divine nature. I am not just a person saved, baptized, and filled. I go into the church, you know. I'm a church worshiper. I worship the Lord Jesus. I go to church on Sunday. You are more than that. You are called to be an environmental changer. You are called to be a light in the middle of the dark world. We, are, we have lost a lot of our spiritual responsibilities. We have not been keeping them. When last have you spoken of Jesus with audacity? When have you last shared that Jesus can intervene in that situation for you? I know that God is able to heal you. Hello, somebody. I know that God is able to bring you wisdom. I know that God is going to take you through that condition. I know that God can break that curse and will break that yoke. Are we like that? Or are we kind of more laid back in our Christian approach? I believe and I posit to us that we tend to be more laid back in our spiritual approach. Approach. But guess what? Uh, the word of God is coming to pass right before our eyes. We are living in the days that are likened unto Sodom and are likened unto Gomorrah. There are people that are in gross darkness and they need to see the light of Jesus. They need to know that there is a God that shed his blood that they might live. They need to know that there is a God that is interested in their health, interested in their, in their, in their prosperity, in their upliftment, interested in their salvation for all of eternity. But if we sit down and we do not speak of what we are convicted of, our world will never know the truth about what we claim we believe. We have to become more vocal. But a, a deeper part of the problem is that we are not experiencing the fullness of the kingdom. Because we are not walking fully by faith. Holy Spirit, Oh, God Almighty. Huh? But we need to look at Jesus as our model now. I can't spend much time there. We need to look at Jesus as our model. Do you believe that the rapture can be any time now, for real? Really, truly, I'm asking you. Do you really believe that God can come before tonight's service is over? Hmm? Are you fully convinced? If you really believe that God could come right now, are you ready to go see him right now? Would you require a, a, a five-minute talk with Bishop or a three-minute talk with Sis or, or a half an hour to hash out a situation between you and Elder? Huh? If God should come now, what grade would you get in terms of your talents? Elo Shama. Yes, God. What grade would you get in terms of your gifts and callings? Would you get an A? Would it be that you would have brought forth two more and now you're at four, started at two? Or would it be that you'd have to say, Lord God, I needed a little more time. I was just warming up to level one. I know you anointed me with three, but I'm just at level one. Now, this is real, okay? This is real. I don't just want to lecture you. I don't just want to tell you biblical facts. I don't want you just to know biblical facts. Something in you must click about what God is saying to us. Right? Something in you must be stirred. Have you been operating like the son that God has called you to be? Let us look at Jesus as our model, okay? Jesus is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, right? That is in St. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. We should know this is like Sunday school stuff from, for us. Amen. Uh, right in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Can you finish it? And the word was God. The same was? In the beginning with God. 
Mm -hmm. And the word became flesh. And we beheld. Oh, Jesus. As of the only begotten of the Father. Lord, all of you need to go back to Sunday school. Amen. In Jesus' name. Or go back to, to, to biblical recitation. Amen. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the word who became flesh. And that word that became flesh dwelt among us. Right? And we beheld his glory. Okay? So Jesus is the visible manifestation of the invisible God. If there's any aspect of God that you can see, it is Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, spoken unto us in times past by the prophets, has in these last spoken to us by his Son, whom he has made heir of all things. All right? Hello? Who is the express image of his person? Bridget, I don't know. We're going to do some scripture memorization. Amen. Because I think our level is very low. So, okay. Here comes Jesus now. Right? So, if you have your Bible with your physical Bible, and I'm encouraging you to, to carry your physical Bible to Bible study, okay? And, and to keep one with you at all times, okay? So, St. Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 13 through 17. Quickly, I want somebody to read it. Amen. I purposely did not put it in the uh, slides because we have a tendency to be lazy. And we just read the slide and we don't touch the Bible in Jesus' name. Amen. We need to contact the Bible and use the Bible. St. John. St. Matthew, rather, chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, sword in hand. Go. Oh, boy. We're going to be in here whole night. Thank you very much. And could we get a mic that those who are hearing can also hear what is being read? Thank you, uh, Sister Dennis. Praise God. So, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist at the river. I'm going to just read it, huh? Your Bible said Jordan? You sure it's not Jericho? At River Jericho? River Jordan, Okay. And what did Jesus tell John? It becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Okay? So John figured that Jesus being greater than him, Jesus being the Messiah, should be the one doing the baptizing. Right? <laughs> so John is like, look, I, I should be baptized of you. I mean, come on, brother. You're the greater. Right? But Jesus says, no, suffer it to be so. Allow it to be so. Why? Because Jesus is our example. All right? He is our example. So he's leading us the way that we should go. Right? Before he went into his public ministry, he was baptized. And what does John uh, Matthew tells us there is that the Holy Spirit descended upon him, right, in the form of a dove. So before you go, you've got to go down in water, right? And you've got to have the Spirit come down upon you and be in you. Yes? So, this is telling us, Jesus is showing us the way, right? Then, he was full of the Holy Spirit, and then God commended him. This is my beloved son, right? God has got to speak for you, right? You don't speak for yourself. When you come to, G when you come to the Lord, it is the Spirit, it is God's Spirit that draws you to him. Hello? So, now notice there that in Matthew chapter 4, uh, somebody else, Matthew chapter 4, it's next door to Matthew chapter 3, amen, a verse... One, uh, can you read anybody? Matthew 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right. So, Jesus was baptized. The Spirit was signified as descending upon him as a dove. And then, because notice, it was right after that, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted, okay? 
So, Jesus is our example. <laughs> Number one, we must be baptized. Number two, we must receive the Holy Spirit. Number three, God must have something to say about you. Right? Who are you? You are my son. Okay? Right? And then the Spirit must lead you. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So, when you come to God, you are going to be tested and you are going to be tried. Hello? When God comes and calls you and you feel the pull to go into fasting and prayer, then it's, you are going to be tested. Are you hearing me? And I think that's one of the aspects of which Matthew 6 is referring to when it says, lead us not into temptation. For the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness... And in the wilderness, he was tempted. So lead us. Lord, we are not asking for it. Oh, are you hearing me? Are we still here? Praise the Lord. So Lord, don't bother lead us into temptation, but de deliver us from the evil one. So wherever we find him, or wherever he finds us, I want the strength to overcome him. Okay? So now notice that Jesus was submitted to the Spirit he was led of the Spirit. He was obedient to the Spirit, right? So James 4 verse 7 comes in right there. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. Resist the devil and he will. Ah, Jesus. Brethren, you know, really, we have to go to quiz next week. Amen. So we are going to quiz you on first, second Peter chapter 1, the first four verses. Amen. And James 4 verse 7. Seems like we forget them, so we need to be reminded. Amen. Is that all right? One brave amen. All right. So uh, Jesus, our model overview. Okay. So you must be baptized. You must you must be baptized, you must receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you must be led of the Spirit and walk in the power of the Spirit. In Luke's account of what Matthew also records, right? Luke said that he came, he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness, but he came out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit. And this is in Luke chapter 4 verse 14. So when God leads us to be processed by the Spirit, it is the intent of God that we come out with great power in the Spirit. So tell somebody, pass your test. Endure the wilderness of your life. Oh, Lord, my God, my God. This is Bible class, right? Anybody you see beside you who looks like, amen, they are going into another dimension, praise the Lord, where they don't need their eyes open. Hallelujah. Just nudge them and tell them to stay in this dimension. Praise God. Amen. So, Jesus came back out in the power of the Spirit. Yes, praise the Lord. Jesus, our model, how to handle temptations. Let's go there. All right? So, Jesus was tested while he was a hunger. While Jesus was hungry. The devil tempted him. Everybody say appetite management. You have to manage your appetites. The enemy is going to come and test you with appetites. With your desires. So is it, is it illegal to be hungry? Is it ungodly to be hungry? Is it a sin to be hungry? No. So if you're hungry and somebody offers you some food, is it a sin not to take the food? Remember that the devil did not offer Jesus some food. He tempted Jesus to abuse his power to make food. When you are on fasting, you are going to get hungry. It's true. If you never fast, you don't know. When you are on fasting, there comes a time when hunger is going to come your way. But when you are fasting, fasting, I-N-G, should you eat the food when the hungry come? One must know the time and place for everything. Hello? So you have to learn to govern and manage and control your appetites. It's not time to eat. It's time to fast. So Jesus went into the word bank and come up and let the devil know, you're not going to tempt me to abuse my creative power because I know when it's time to eat and when it's time not to eat. And now it's not a time to eat, so I am not going to eat and you're not going to win with me. You have to learn to manage your appetites. Everybody say appetite management. Our world has gone crazy 
because nobody wants to manage their appetite based on what God has said. Everybody wants to manage their appetite based on what their appetite is saying. So if your appetite is a crayfish, you say, let the, let the belly say crayfish. And if the appetite says, you know, I don't know, patty, praise God, or stew beef, amen, then, then you are run by your appetite. Do not let your appetites run you. Don't let your appetites govern you. The power of the Holy Spirit is to help us to manage these appetites that have run off the road. Are you hearing me? Lord Jesus. Maybe I need to have us to stand up and to move about. Amen. You have to learn to manage your appetites. As a child of God, if you're going to be successful at being a son of God in the earth, you cannot let your appetites rule you. Hello. The same thing is true about your emotions too. Because some of us are run by our emotions. Well, this is how I feel. Well, change how you feel. Anybody still with me here? Not very, anyway. um, so don't allow your feelings to. <laughs> Some of us are run by our feelings. Not true. Come on, man, talk the truth. Well, I don't feel like doing this. Or, or I feel like I'm under the weather. Or, you know, I just feel down. Or, or I just feel. And, 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 and the Bible tells us that you're not to forsake the assembly of yourself. And say, I just don't feel like assembling tonight. You need to rule your feelings. Well, I just don't feel like wearing the clothes this way. And I just don't feel like feelings running you. When you are a child of God, your feelings must be governed by the principles of heaven. Hello? All right, okay, okay. Next one now is uh, right leadership, right? So the devil tempted Jesus to throw himself down. Yeah? Throw himself off the, the, the very tall place. Yeah? And uh, so he would what? Test the angelic backup system. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. The angels are there to help you lest you dash your foot against a stone. Uh, the God never intended that you go throwing yourself off cliffs. Hello, somebody. Angels guiding me right now. I'm going up to the top of Mount Everest and I'm going to take a flight down. And the angels are going to carry me to the bottom. When you jump off, the angels might not be up there. They might be close to the bottom and you might slip out their hands. Right leadership, okay? You've got to lead your life in a way that appreciates God's provisions and don't seek to abuse them. Should we continue in sin because grace abound? Right leadership. I'm going to lead my life right. My life is under the leadership of God. Oh, because I know a friend that has a flat fix, uh, a mobile flat fix van, you know, you a puncture tire van, somebody that can fix your tire. And I know I have a friend, amen. Uh, Brother Gary is my friend, and he has a, a puncture tire, a mobile puncture tire machine. And so, what does that mean? I'm going to go look for every nail, every grass buckle, amen, and, 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 and every broken pickaxe. And I'm going to drive over them and puncture the tire because I have my friend, and he's always on call, amen. If I was Gary, Amen. You'd stay punctured. Praise God. Amen. You'd stay punctured. Is the truth? Uh, you, you are going to always be abusing a system? No. You must lead your life under God's guidance. That when, if you have to access mercy, it must, be it must not be because you're careless. It must not be because you're intentional in your digression. It must be that you are overtaken by some real means and then you need assistance. So your life must be under the correct leadership of God. That you don't go about seeking to abuse the provisions. Are you with me, saints? All right. The, the next thing that Jesus demonstrated to us is worship management. Do not allow any spirit to rule you to get them to be worshipped. Keep God as the focus of your worship. When you know that God alone is to be worshipped, nobody can take his place. You get it? I don't care how great you are. I will admire you, but I ain't going to worship you. So notice what Lucifer wanted was to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. And they were his to give. How many believe that? Satan actually owned the kingdom. Where did he get it from? Adam. Adam gave up the kingdoms. 
<laughs> he gave up the earth realm because he yielded himself to Lucifer and Lucifer became his God. Because he obeyed Lucifer above God. Are you hearing me? There are things that God has for you that are yours and nobody can take them. You don't need to take a shortcut. You don't need to subscribe to the system of the world to be blessed. You don't need to steal. You don't need to scam. You don't need to rip off anybody. You don't need to tell anybody any lie. Hello? What you need to do is follow what God says you ought to do. And when you do that, you will, you will receive. God is a God of his word. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not lie. He will not change. He will not take back his word. Right? So you don't need a shortcut. Jesus came to take back the kingdoms of the earth. Do you know that? His mission was to reconquest earth. And what the devil did was offer him up a shortcut to it. Hello? So just bow down, man, and worship. And what you come here for, I'll just give you right now. You don't need to do a thing more. Hello? The word and the works of Jesus. Jesus was on front line right now showing us how we should handle the devil. How we should handle life. How we should handle temptations. No shortcut. Do not abuse your privileges. Know when it's time to eat and when it's time not to eat. Are you hearing me? Know who is to worship. Whether he gives you a Rolls Royce or you are just rolling down the hill with your ten-toe turbo. Amen. He alone is to be worshipped. Boy, look how long I'm serving God. And I can't even get a car yet. I can't even buy a car yet. Well, you don't have a license. So why are you doing, what are you doing with a car? Go get the license first in Jesus' name. You know, and look how long, hallelujah, I've been believing God for a miracle. And I have no miracle. I am half dead. Amen. I'm in grave clothes. I'm looking to die any minute now. Amen. No, 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 no. Follow God and God will prove his word to you. Abraham took 25 years before he heard Isaac cried. Over that 25 years, he had to hold on to the sure word of God. There is a way that seems right unto a man. But the end of that way is not necessarily good. Oh my God. And then the fourth thing there, a lot of times we don't talk about this, is the ministry of angels. After Jesus was tested, after he had ended his fasting, after he had passed his test, God sent angels to minister unto Jesus. Whenever you are going through your tests, whenever you come upon severe and tremendous trials, the angels of the Lord are around you. And when you need their help, God will send them to you. His, his angels are ministering spirits. They are sent out to minister unto God's people. So don't you worry yourself. There are times when we feel like, I mean, absolutely giving up. There are times when we feel like we have no more energy left. The angels came and ministered to Jesus. When you stand up for God, when you endure your tests, when you walk through your fiery trials, and keep your head up God will send help and send strength to you at the perfect time of your need I want to give God thanks for that this night I want to thank him because and Jesus as our model is not an easy thing and so when we look at Jesus as our model remember now you know he is the light and you are the you and I are the ones in the dark wondering how am I going to follow this man in the light I like this diagrammatic you know, there is Jesus quite calm and cool and collected in the white, right? And you and I are the one in the black. I wonder, say, Lord, teach me, Lord, to follow you. Father, I want to be like you. Blessed Redeemer, are you with me? Pure as thou art, are you still here? How many know that to follow God is not an easy job? How many know that? We're talking about the word and works of Jesus. All right? So, we want to learn some more about Jesus here. We're going to look at Jesus as being consecrated. Okay? Jesus was consecrated. Saints, it might seem a little bit boring. It might even seem a little bit academic to you. But in order for us to be what God wants us to be, we have to observe the pattern that he sent here. And that pattern is Jesus. Please notice that Jesus maintained right personal relationship with God. Above the glamour, above the miracles, 
above the signs, above the wonders, he gave time to fellowship. Right? Jesus prayed often and alone. Mark chapter 1 tells us that, 35 through 39. And Luke chapter 5, verse 16 tells us, Jesus would often remove himself from the crowd. And he would find himself in a wilderness. Or he would find himself in a quiet place. And he would be having fellowship with God. I want to tell you, saints of God, we talk about it a lot. But we don't fight about it enough. You have to fight for your time with God. And I'm not talking the time when you're praying on the top of your lungs. When everybody is hearing you on a Sunday morning. Or when everybody's hearing you. You understand? When you're at work, I want to show off that you're a Christian and you're praying loud over the food. Hallelujah. Amen. And fly eating it for you. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about when it really matters. When you and God are having your private time. You have to fight for your private time with God. You must. I know there are days when you fall off. I know sometimes you might go for, for days and you don't even get a good prayer in. But you have to fight. And one of the things that I notice here is that Jesus moved as he was led. How many know that God doesn't necessarily want you always to sit down for one whole hour hollering and bawling? Amen. How many of you really know that? You know that God is not impressed with you just showing up routinely every day to ball. Every day you get up. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the morning. Thank you for the clothes. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the dog. Thank you for the cow. Amen, Jesus. Hallelujah. And you feel good. It's a 20 hallelujah for five minutes later. Man, you feel good. And you run out and gone. There is no God. You don't feel a thing. God, you don't hear God speak to you. You don't, you don't get a psalm. You don't get a song. There is no fellowship. There is no revelation. There is nothing. Just you punching in the clock saying here I am amen God's trying to talk to you you're just saying you know you know I want to say this say this say this and you're gone you just wonder what I just said that's how God experiences it I think you never have time to listen to his mind why do you think Jesus was so powerful why did Jesus pray such a short prayer over that that that, that lunch from the boy you know, I often wonder, if Jesus were to call some of us to pray over that food, maybe the, the fish would get up and swim off. All that Jesus did, see with me, my mind is very animated. Amen. Oh, we already blessing this and blessing that. And you're praying for this, the, the, the salt and the pepper. You don't need all of that in the name of Jesus. Give God thanks for the food and eat it in Jesus' name. Amen. Huh? Jesus lifted up his eyes. Father, I know you always hear me. End of story. Start to break bread. You want to know why he had such confidence? One of the big reasons is he is in constant fellowship with his father. Oh my God. So it's like he just left off talking to him. And it's like he just said, hold on daddy. Let me see what's going on here. There is no food. The, the people are hungry. I just gave them revelation from you. I just gave them insight from you. But now they are hungry. I can't send them away hungry. Daddy, here we go. <laughs> but when you don't have fellowship, you have to muster up to prayer. You see, every V and striation cross your forehead. I don't hear the folks. Five hours after you start prayer, not even the mosquito feel the kind of glory. Because, you know, God is not impressed with our ritual. God is not impressed with us just coming for come. God is impressed with us really and truly coming to him. Father, this is what's on my mind. I'm tired. My neighbor has diabetes and he's close to death. And I want him to experience you as the healer. Hey, Shanda. Lord, this is on my mind. I see so many children in the community. They, they are running about naked. They're doing all manner of things. They're getting polluted. And God, my heart burdens for me. I want them to come to know you as a deliverer, as a comforter, as a friend. He wants to hear what you are seeing and what you are experiencing. Not just, Father, I need 5,000 to buy some gas this week, Lord. Hallelujah. You don't know us the money, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. The mackerel price gone up, God. And hallelujah. Don't even bother mention cooking oil, Jesus. Father, we're making make them a charge with so much. Hallelujah. Uh, 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 uh. Those are not kingdom oriented prayers, brethren. Those are not you and God, real intimate dialogue. God wants his kingdom in the earth. 
He wants you and I to live above poverty, to live above sickness, to live above disease, to have everlasting life, to live in peace, to live in joy. Oh my God. But we need to have more fellowship with God. It takes effort. It takes deliberateness. It takes energy. But Jesus was led by the Spirit. Often he was just disappear. You see, what I have found is that some of my most uh, productive prayer sessions is when I'm just led to pray. You see, most of the time when I have a systematized prayer time, I have trouble. You don't have to say amen. This is just me. You see, when the Holy Ghost tells me to go pray, I'll just draw away and go pray. Oh my sweet, it can't done. Anybody in here on the same page with me? It's true. You understand? When you, when you set your six o'clock and to get up six o'clock, sorry, let me be here. All kind of things come. I mean, you're up, you're full of energy to midnight and the moment 5.30 come. <sighs> you start travail and it's not by the Holy Ghost. You know. <laughs> Hallelujah. You start travail and it's no Holy Ghost. His sleep take you. <sighs> mm. It's no burden of mercy you're feeling for a soul. Hallelujah. My God, you're going up some hill, going down in some valley, and it's no revelation knowledge. That old body just conk out on you. But you see, when, the whole, when you're led by the Spirit, you're like the wind. Hallelujah. Lord, just pull you away for 15 minutes and say, come and talk to me, child. Wake you up at 3 o'clock and say, come and whisper in my ears. I have something to tell you. That was Jesus. One minute he's with them. The next minute I want where the master gone. He's gone to a quiet place, talking to the God, hallelujah, as a man. Jesus prayed as a man, not as God. And so he would go to God as a man, teaching us the way. Jesus prayed often and alone. When you come to organize prayer sessions, there has to be time for you to pray alone. So we can be in here in a crowd, but you're over by the corner praying in that aloneness. But there's another level of aloneness when you're really, really alone. And you don't need to be worrying about the bush. You don't need to be, you don't need to be worrying about the cars. You don't need to be worrying about anybody hearing you. There are days I'd like to be, the writer says, all alone. You must practice to entertain God's presence alone. You will hear him clearly. I want to tell you, Jesus got his power from the time he spent in the presence of God. Jesus' power was accessed as a man through dwelling in the spiritual zone. You want to have power? You want the power that God gives you to manifest in your life? You have to learn to live at the place of intercession, at the place of connection with God, which is what we call prayer. The other thing that uh, um, uh, demonstrates Jesus' consecration was that Jesus obeyed the will of his Father above every other will. Jesus was so focused on fulfilling his mission that nothing was allowed to get in his way. Do you get that? When you are consecrated, you watch what you put in your body. When you are consecrated, you watch what you listen to. When you are consecrated, you watch what you do with your time. When you have been dedicated unto God, you, you, you don't just say any old thing and do any old thing. Are you hearing me? You know and understand how precious you are. Oh, Lord God. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost has been talking to us about that. We need to get back to that place of deeper consecration. We, are, we, we look at ourselves as being hallowed, as being separated from the world unto God. And we are here serving the world, but we are keeping ourselves from the things that are in the world. I think it was John who said it in his writing, uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. Are you hearing me? So when you are consecrated, you will seek to be in obedience to the whole word of God. And so we have levels of things to obey. You have the written word. Word, right? This is the written word. It's the Bible. But you have the spoken word as I'm speaking it now. And then you have the speaking word, which is the Holy Ghost in you. 
You're responsible for what is written. You're responsible for what you hear. And you're responsible for what the Holy Ghost is telling you to do. So we have a responsibility to stay in alignment with God. Am I consecrated? Have I been obeying God? Or do I do what I feel like doing when I feel like doing it and let God comes, God's business come a little later? Okay. We have to cultivate an awareness of the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit in us, right? We have the divine nature in us, but we need to cultivate an awareness of that purpose, right? So Jesus in St. John chapter 5, turn there quickly. In St. John chapter 5, verse 17. Mike. Oh, this is growing pains, but I'm willing to grow with the pains. St. John chapter 5, verse 17. Anybody that has found it can ask for the mic. Sister Talia, mic. John chapter 5, verse 17, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto, and I work. Very good. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Verse 19 and 20, Sister Talia. Then answered Jesus, and said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do, for what things Soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that he may marvel. If you have a hard copy of your Bible, you should mark this scripture. It is extremely insightful. Jesus says that my Father has worked to this point. But I must take up that work and continue my father work. He says, I, am don't, I don't do anything of myself. But that which I see my father do, that do I. This applies to you and I. Okay? You have to be led by the Spirit of God. For it is the Spirit of God that is showing you what needs to be done. It is the Spirit of God that will tell you that that brother is having an excruciating headache and that the Spirit of God wants to heal him and wants to work through you to bring about his healing. Oh my God. What we have to get to is to understand that Jesus as a man, he never did anything of his own self. Can we go right? So my Father shows me all things, Right? He himself does. So the will of God is that people get deliverance. The will of God is that people overcome sin. The will of God is that people be healed. The will of God is that people be saved and delivered from bondage. But he is the one doing the work. But he's looking for your hand and he's looking for my hand. He's looking for your body and he's looking for my body. Hallelujah. He is looking for vessels through whom he can work. So Jesus was that ultimate example showing us that the Spirit of God has somebody near you that he wants to heal. Somebody near you he wants to comfort. Somebody near you he wants to pull out of bondage. But if you're not in the Spirit and if you're not paying attention... You won't see what God is doing around you. Hallelujah. And what he wants you to get involved with. My father is working in the spirit, but he needs my physical hand. It is he that set it up that way. He needs my hand to touch. He needs my hand to inspire. Can we go to the next one? He says, I can of my own self do nothing. See him, John chapter 5 verse 30. What is Jesus saying? Go to John 5 in your Bible and look at verse 30. Jesus says, I can of mine own self do nothing. So is Jesus an invalid? What do you think? (laughs) 
He says, I can do nothing of my own self. Next one, beloved. He says, I seek not my own will, but the will of my Father which hath sent me. The next one, beloved. The works which my Father hath given me to finish. That's what I'm doing. Jesus is gone to prepare a mansion for us. But he has left us down here to tell the world, come with me to my father's house. He's left us down here to tell the world, there is a God and he loves you and he cares about you and he wants you to be free and he wants you to be delivered. He left us to continue the work. He started the work. So look at the continuum. Look at the chain reaction, right? Hallelujah. My father works hitherto and I work. That is Jesus. Jesus work hitherto and then he ascend and then he leave us and then he, we must work from the point where Jesus left off to the day when he appears again. He says, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. So Jesus is no longer here. He can no longer do those works. We have to do the work. Oh Lord, I wish somebody would catch that one. Jesus is no longer here. He will not lay his hand on any one more person in the physical flesh down here. He's not going to do it. It's going it's gonna, to it's gonna be you. Uh, Jesus told people their business. Uh, he gave them res revelation, knowledge, and wisdom. He told them prophecies. Uh, he's not going to do that anymore. Uh, in the physical form, he's looking for you. He's looking for me. Uh, he's waiting on you and I uh, to realize that you are more than a carpenter. Uh, you are more than a teacher. You are more than a, a, a businesswoman. Uh, you are more than an administrator. You are more than a technician. You are more than a, 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 a private person. Uh, hallelujah. You are my son uh, and I have work for you to do. It's not your own work. It's my work. But I need you to do it. Every one of us are called to model this. When you are walking on the road, who is in you? God, Holy Spirit is in you. He wants to save people. He wants to deliver people. He wants to use you to turn your workplace upside down. So he's actively executing his design in your world, in your time. Lord God. But he wants you to come into agreement with what he's doing in the physical world and begin to effect it in the physical world brethren saints those that are listening to me god is doing things in your world there are people whose hearts he's working on you don't know you know but he's working on their hearts there is a man that is ripe for the picking there is a soul that god has been pulling and he's ready to step over Keto uh, Shataya. And God has put him in your vicinity. And the Spirit is trying to tell you, speak to that man. Uh, Holy Ghost is trying to tell you, share with him the vision you have. Holy Ghost is trying to tell you, uh, invite him to fellowship. Holy Ghost is trying to tell you, hallelujah, something about the man uh, that you will tell the man. Uh, and that word of knowledge uh, is going to convince the person that there is something supernatural operating through you. But God wants you to see what he is doing. Somebody say, open my eyes to see. Somebody say, unstop my ears to hear. Holy Ghost. God is interested in using you and I in a profound way. So Jesus, our model, a closer look at it now. When you boil this thing down, what it really boils down to is what the Holy Spirit said and what the Holy Spirit showed him to do. Wherever Jesus went, he was listening and he was watching. 
Hallelujah. Wherever he walked, he was listening and he was watching. Are you listening at work? Are you listening on the bus? Are you watching at the roadside? Are you listening in the service? Are you listening in your family table? God has something to do in your house. I say God has something doing in your community. But are you watching and are you listening? Your boss came to you with a problem. He shared with you a personal condition. Hallelujah. In his marriage. You, you know, of all the other workers, your boss come to you, come unload and tell you his problem. It is God trying to tell you, introduce that woman. Introduce that man to me. It is I that have worked on them. It is I that have stimulated them. I am doing something in them. Will you comply? Somebody in here, I pray to God wherever you are, God is talking to you right over that thing that you're working. God is talking to you right in that environment that you find yourself. I say God wants to use you to do miraculous and stupendous things. You don't need a week of revival. You don't need seven years at the school of prophecy. Hallelujah. What you need is an attitude of obedience. What you need is an attitude of listening. Uh, what you need is an attitude of watching. Uh, if I can see what God is doing, uh, then I can do it. Uh, if I can hear what God is saying, uh, then I can say it. What is God saying about your boss? What is God saying about your family? What is God showing you that he's doing in your world? Can we seriously ask God to open our eyes for for 30 seconds, can you, can you lift up your hands, if you will, or one of them, and just really pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, open our eyes to see what opportunities uh, you have opened up unto us. Lord God Almighty, uh, open up our eyes to realize, uh, hallelujah, that you have called us to the kingdom for such a time as now, and somebody beside me is dying, uh, somebody beside me is filled with fear. Somebody beside me is dreading their tomorrow. And I feel something, Lord. I hear your voice. Ah, God, you're leading me to talk to Tamisha. Hallelujah. But I am afraid. Hallelujah. Open my eyes to see that it is you. Lord, I feel a nudging in my spirit. Hallelujah. To fast tomorrow. I'm feeling a nudging in my spirit to go on three days fasting to shut in. Hallelujah. To take the weekend and seek your face. Lord, let me know I'm hearing your voice. Lord, show me where you want me to go. Show me what you want me to do. Somebody ought to ask the Lord with attitude tonight. Wherever you are, whenever you're listening this clipping, whenever you're watching this study, Jesus is not interested. Hallelujah. Only in the great meetings. He's not just interested. Hallelujah. In the great revival services. He wants to have a revival in your world. He wants to do a revival in your house. He wants to do a revival in your heart. Uh, but you need to place your eyes on him. Uh, and you need to put your ears towards his mouth. Uh, Father, will you allow us to see what you're doing? Uh, Holy Spirit, uh, will you cause us to hear what you're saying? I want to model Jesus. He listened to what the Spirit says. And he did it. He watched what the Father did. And he followed. We need to let go our notions of who we are. We need to take up God's version of who we are. And let go of our versions of ourselves. You want to know one of the biggest reasons for this? Time is always against us. Would you believe that we have been talking for more than an hour already? Would you believe it? No, I'm serious. You are supposed to realize that it's been over an hour now. And look at what we have covered, right? There's a whole lot, of more, there's a whole lot more information there, right? But we are agents of time. We are bound and trapped by time. We live in time. We can't escape it. And God who understands this and knows this is he that designed it. 
has led you where you are in the time where you are. And he wants to use us. Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. God wants to use you. Not necessarily at the corner of a street with a loud mic. He wants to use you right among those three girls that you sit and talk with every morning. He has a word that he wants to send one of them. He has something he wants you to do to one of them. He wants to bring the kingdom to your neighbor. But he wants to use you. Is, are your eyes in the spirit looking for what God is doing in your world? Or is it that your attentions are so taken up with the world, with your daily life? Huh? We are so taken up with making bread, uh, with putting roof over our heads. We are so taken up with our families, growing our families. Please don't forget, God has something for you to do right where you are, affecting somebody right where you are. But you have to be consecrated. You have to get to the place where you, you dedicate yourself. Jesus was dedicated to what he did. He never allowed anything to distract him. Jesus had a strategic engagement plan. Where Jesus went to meet people at the level of their needs. Are you hearing me? You have to meet people at the level of their needs. When God puts somebody in your world and they are hungry and you are able to provide them with some food. It is God setting up a strategic meeting. Are you following me? Next slide. Oh my God, let us not wonder. Could we stay focused and don't let anything distract us? Go, go, go. Strategic engagement. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Next, next, next. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, Jesus. You have to meet persons at the level of their needs. You have to identify with people what is going on in their life. Hallelujah. What is their fight? What failures are they experiencing? what is in their future you cannot just have a stiff model you have to preach you have to teach you have to act hallelujah god has put you in a strategic position deacon robinson hallelujah you're not just there for there you're not just there to earn he has put you in a strategic position he might not send somebody your way every day but there are many days that he sends people your way or send you their way and i want us to really we are going to stop here tonight because time has come upon us and and my god my god the the, the the truth is hallelujah there is a next level now where we are going to go to talk about hallelujah the word and works of jesus the water into wine so we are actually now next week we are going to begin to explore the the, the miracles of jesus and the words his teachings as he went along but what you have to get in your spirit and my spirit is that god is is doing things in your world. Me say God is at your desk doing stuff. God is in your work area doing stuff. Are you with me saints? Are you hearing me? God is around you. And he is sending people your way. And sending you people's ways. I want us to think very deeply on this. I want you to meditate on this very deeply in your own personal space. Ask the Lord to lead you to a place of sensitivity where when he says, come away with me in the wilderness to sup, hallelujah, you move with him. When he says, sit down, let me pour something into you, you are ready to stay there. When he says, look to your left, there is a man in a black shirt, hallelujah, and he is on his knees, hallelujah. He's about to do something ridiculous, hallelujah. Go over there and tell him Jesus loves him, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have to be at that place where God can tell you there is a girl that's going to come right where you are and she's going to be dressed in a yellow blouse. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A blue skirt. Hallelujah. And a white sneaker. Hallelujah. She's going to come and she's going to ask you, hallelujah, for a candy. But don't give her the candy. Hallelujah. Offer her to pray for her and tell her that her mother is not going to die. You have got to be at that place where the Holy Ghost can talk to you or where the Holy Ghost can relate to you. Remember, you are not your own. You are bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to your king. Your daddy is your father and he's also your king. He has begun a work and he expects you to finish that work. Who has he sent to you for a word of comfort? Have you ignored them? Who 
has he told you to pray for? Have you turned your back on them? Jesus Christ. What have you been blind to that God has been showing you all this time? Could we all stand tonight? Those of us that are in the house of God, could we all stand? My desire is not to cover gamuts of information without application. My desire is that if we speak one word, or if we go into two words, you get the understanding of them and see how you can apply them. Is there some little teenage girl that always comes to my cubicle who needs a word of revelation from Jesus and I'm the one carrying it? Is it the case that that man that keeps passing my yard every Saturday morning, 9 a.m., and he always stops and looks like he wants to say something to me. And I am always feeling that drive, hallelujah, to say so and so to him. Is it that God has been sending his wounded son your way and wants you to give him a word of knowledge? Holy God. That thing that is in your heart to go visit these older folks in your community, no matter where they come from, no matter their religious affiliation or not. Huh? Could it be that God is trying to tell you, I've given you the ministry of helps and I've blessed you and positioned you to go and be a balm, to go and pour in oil and wine and through you pouring in oil and wine, I'm going to bring many souls to the kingdom. Can we at this point really just ask God, what are you doing in my world? Can you allow me to see it again? Father, can you consecrate my eyes? Lord, I want to dedicate my focus to you tonight in the name of Jesus. This is for real. Hallelujah. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Amen. And encourage you to go in your own private time and pray. You're a preacher. You're a minister. You're a pastor. You're, you're some executive in the church. God is telling you things. He is doing things in your midst. You're missing them because you're not lined in. You're not tapped in to what is going on in the spirit through the Holy Ghost. And so you're walking in disobedience because what he's telling you to do, you're not hearing. Or you're hearing and not doing. And what he's showing you to do, you are seeing but you're not obeying. Can you change that in your life? I tell you that if you change that, you will see an absolute revolution in the manifest presence and power of God in your life, in your world, every day and any day you choose to walk in obedience. May the God of all peace guide you and guard you. I seriously pray that the wisdom of God will encapsulate you. And above all, I ask Jesus Christ, our Savior, to open your eyes to see what he is doing and your ears to hear what you are saying and that he might empower you to rise up with his energy and his strength and go forth. No matter if anybody gives you a credit, or if no one sees what you're doing, God, who is in heaven and who is right beside you, knows what you're doing. Let's go for it. Jesus was our example and still is our example. And we are going to study his life and see how much we can expunge, see how much we can pull out of his example and apply in our lives. God bless you. If the rapture tarries until next week, amen, you can join us right here, amen, or any other time your schedule might allow. God is doing a great work right at your foot. And he wants to use you to be a part of it. Please ask him to bring you in line. And I'm sure he will. God bless you and good evening. Amen. In Jesus.